In this lecture, we're going to go through three of the most important basic tools that we're going to use throughout this course. And that is expectation, covariance, and the Gaussian distribution. Now that actually sounds like the title of a movie that I will watch. Now, anyway, the single most important distribution for sensor fusion and nonlinear filtering is the Gaussian distribution. In many cases, our goal is to describe our results using the mean vector or expected value and the covariance matrix of a Gaussian distribution. And if our result is not Gaussian, we anyway tend to approximate our results using the mean and covariance of this non-Gaussian distribution, even though these do not fully capture all the facets of our actual distribution. So as we said, probability distributions are often characterized by their mean vectors and covariance matrices. So how do we calculate these? Well, the expected value or mean of a m-dimensional random vector x, defined like this, is the expected value of x. Now, the expectation of x is defined as an integral of the vector x weighted by the probability density of that vector. So what we have here is that for values of x, which has high probability density, will influence our expected value more than values of x, which has low probability density. Often we denote this mean vector here as either mu or x bar in this case. And we call this the first moment of p of x. Now, the notation here is simply shorthand for that we integrated from minus infinity to infinity for all the dimensions of x. So that was the expected value. Now, the covariance of x, or the second central moment of p of x, is written like this and is defined as the expectation of x minus its mean times the same thing transposed. Now, we can view this factor here as the distance between x and its mean, that is, how much does x spread around its mean value? Now, if we write it like this, we assume that x is a column vector, as we will do throughout the whole of this course, as this here, the product here, should be an outer product. That is, we have a total matrix, times a wide matrix. So this product here is an m by m square matrix, which is symmetric and positive semi-definite, as this is a square here. So it becomes needs to be positive semi-definite. So that is the definition of the covariance matrix of a random variable x. Now, for discrete valued random variables, the above integrals are then replaced by corresponding summations. So we have summation here instead. So let us look a bit more into how we can interpret this covariance matrix using an example where we have independent samples from a zero mean two dimensional random vector x, which has the components x1 and x2. Now our samples are plotted in red here in this figure. The question is, if you can guess the covariance matrix of x, using these samples here. Now, to help you out a bit, we have also plotted one standard deviation and three standard deviation contours of the distribution of x. So we have three sigma contour here, and we have one sigma contour here. Additionally, we can mention that the covariance of a two-dimensional random variable has the following structure. So the covariance of x can be written like this. Where sigma one is the standard deviation of x one and sigma two is the standard deviation of x two. And the factor rho here is what's called the correlation factor. So, what do you think the covariance of x is? I would encourage you to pause the video here and think about this yourself for a couple of minutes, and then we can go through the results together. So, as I mentioned, the covariance matrix is a measure for how the samples of a random vector uh, spread around its mean. Now, as x is a zero mean random vector, its mean is located here.
at 0, 0. And if we look at the structure of the covariance matrix that we define here, we see that we basically need to find the standard deviation of x1 and x2 plus the correlation factor rho. Now, the standard deviation of x1 and x2 can be found by projecting this one sigma contour onto both dimensions here, and then looking at the distance between the projected contour and the mean. So if we do this, we get sigma 1 and sigma 2 approximately equal to 1.4. So we can start filling in our covariance matrix here. So what about the correlation factor? So we know that the correlation factor is a value between minus one and one that tells us how correlated two random variables are. If the correlation factor is, for example, 1, the two random variables are fully positively correlated, meaning that x1 here, for example, is a deterministic positive function of x2, and vice versa. Now, if we look at our samples, we see that there is a quite a significant positive correlation here. So if we have a high value on x1, there's a high probability that x2 also has a high value. But it's definitely not a deterministic mapping, right? As if it were, all the samples here would collapse and fall on a line like this. But that's not the case, right? So we have some spread around this. So this would mean raw equal to 1 if all the samples were on this line. Now in this case, I would say that the correlation is somewhere around 0 0.9. So we have 0 0.9 here. Putting this together, we get a final guess for our covariance matrix, which is, so the variance in each dimension is around 2, and we have a cross covariance of 1.8. So does this match what you guessed? So if we look at the covariance matrix for a random variable, it will tell us both the variance in the different dimensions, but it will also tell us how correlated the different dimensions are. So we have a cross covariance of 1.8 here between x1 and x2. And this information is something that is used extensively in sense of fusion and nonlinear filtering, which we will see later in this course. Sometimes we're interested in finding the expected value of a random variable numerically. Perhaps we are not able to solve the involved integrals explicitly, or more commonly, when we do not actually know the underlying distribution, but have access to a large number of samples from it. So in this case, we can use the law of large number, which states that sample averages converges to expected values for large sample sizes. Now, if x1, x2, and so on are independent and identically distributed random variables, distributed according to some distribution p of x, then the sample average, that is we sum all the samples and divide by the number of samples, will converge to the actual expected value of x under p of x if we let the number of samples grow to infinity. Now we can think of this as throwing a dice many times, where each roll of the dice we generate a new independent and identically distributed sample from our distribution of dice face values. If we do this sufficiently many times, eventually the average face value converges to expected value, which we can calculate to be 3.5 like this. So this is a way to numerically calculate expected values. So now that we know what expected value and covariance is, it's time to look at the most important distribution of them all, at least in this course. And that is the Gaussian distribution. And as you will see, there is a clear connection with the mean and covariance of a random variable. So we write like this to denote that x is a Gaussian random variable with mean mu and covariance q. 
And the PDF of x is then denoted like this. So P of x, where we use this notation here to denote the Gaussian PDF as a function of x with the parameters mu and q. Note that there's an important difference with what we write here, where we are saying that x is distributed according to Gaussian distribution with these parameters mu and q. But here we are referring to the actual function as a function of x with these parameters. So by definition, the Gaussian PDF can be expressed like this, where we have here a constant term, which is dependent on the covariance, times the exponential to the power of a quadratic function of x, where we have x minus its mean squared, which is then normalized by or scaled by the covariance matrix inverse. If we plot this function here in the scalar case for a Gaussian distribution with mean zero and variance one, we get this classical bell-shaped curve, and where the peak is at the mean, which is zero in this case, and the spread around the mean is dependent on the variance. So note that a Gaussian random variable is completely determined by its mean and its covariance matrix. So we do not need any other parameters to describe a Gaussian distribution. Later in this course, we will use this extensively when we describe the results of our filters. One of the nicer properties with Gaussian random variables is what happens when we have a linear combination of independent Gaussian random variables. So let x and y be Gaussian random variables with these means and covariances. If we now construct a new random variable z, which is then a linear combination of x and y, like this, so z is equal to a times x plus b times y, where a and b are now deterministic matrices. Then z will also be a Gaussian random variable, which mean can be calculated like this. So the mean of z is the expected value of ax plus by. Now, as we can always split the expectation of a sum into its individual components, we get the expected value of ax plus the expected value of by. And as a and b are deterministic matrices, we can move them outside of the expectation. So we get a times the expected value of x, which is mu x, plus b times the expected value of y, which is mu y. Now for the covariance, it's a bit more tricky, but by definition, the covariance of z is equal to the covariance of ax plus by. We're just inserting what z is, right? Now as x and y are independent, we can divide this covariance of this sum into the covariance of the different parts here, or the different terms in the sum. Now note that we cannot do this in general, as we need to consider the cross covariance terms, which in this case is the cross covariance of ax by, and the cross covariance of by and ax. But as x and y are independent, these terms here are zero. So we can ignore them here. Now, again, as A and B are deterministic, we can move them outside of the covariance, but instead of getting them just as a factor that we got here, when we calculated the mean, we get them squared here. And as we're dealing with matrices, we need to be a bit careful about which order we do the square. So in this case, we get a times qx, a transpose, plus b, qy, b transpose. And this is a general rule for the covariance. So if you have a covariance of a deterministic matrices times a random vector, the result will be a times the covariance of the random vector times a transpose. Now, if you feel that I went through this a bit quickly, I would highly recommend that you try to derive this expression here yourself, using the definition of covariance that we presented at the beginning of this lecture, and perhaps also brush up on rules related to the expectation operator. And I will think that you will find this well worth the effort when we start to discuss the actual material of this course. For your convenience, here is a summary of the basic statistics result 
that we have presented in the set of primer and statistics lectures. I would encourage you to familiarize yourself with these expressions and make sure that you understand what they are. You might also find this slide handy when we go through the results about nonlinear filtering and the rest of the lectures in this course.